ik ga even waarschijnlijk zoeken doorgaan om te zien oh, ja. waar dat de naamwerkstelling is in Tartaria. Want ik wil niet dat dat daar staat in Mieten of zo. Okay, thank you everyone. So uh, we can start. Please have a seat, please. So uh, we are very happy to today to be able to welcome Peter, Peter, Jonken, uh, Peter Jonker and Stefan van Doren. So I'd like to say a few, a few words about them so that you know where they are coming from. So we'll start with Stefan. Uh, so he's actually born in Belgium and uh, he did his uh, PhD here in Leuven in theoretical physics. And then he did some postdocs, uh, the first one in Swansea, if I remember well, in the UK, the second one at the university, uh, at the, the, the New York State University. And so since 2012, he's school full professor at the Utrecht University. And so uh, his expertise, as you already have guessed, is, th is theoretical physics. So then we have our other speaker, which is Peter Jonker. He had a master's degree in Utrecht in 1997, uh, then moved on to Amsterdam, where he did his PhD, which he obtained in 2001, if I look it up, yeah. And so he did a few postdocs, the first one in, in Cambridge in the UK, and the second one at Harvard Smithsonian Center of Astrophysics in the US. So in 2014, he received an ERC, uh, consolidator grant on the topic of black holes, and since 2017 he's full professor at Radboud University. And so their topic of today is about black holes, so that's what their uh, talk will be about, and he, they will get the floor. So, please. Good. So, welcome. Thanks, uh, thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, of course, this is my alma mater, and I'm really pleased to uh, uh, to be back in Leuven. Of course, the astronomers don't know me; maybe never saw me or anything. And that's all uh, totally fine. It's a great occasion to meet you, uh, and some of the people in the theory group, of course, uh, I know very well. Thanks for, thanks for coming. So. Um, yeah, what is this meeting between kind of theoretical physics and, uh, uh, and, and, and astronomy? This actually started one day, uh, I was in Utrecht looking out of my window, I saw the Eshon building and I was asking myself, uh, well, what is this Eshon, uh, who is there and wh wh why are they moving away? Uh, uh, at that time the plans were pretty much decided, so I, I gave a sort of last attempt to keep Utrecht uh, maybe still some having some context and, uh, and so I, I started going there and I met Peter there and we started chatting about all kinds of uh, things very informally 
And from one thing came the other, and we were thinking about what is binding us uh, and a kind of like the physics of black holes that was kind of interesting for me and also for Peter. And we organized, uh, we organized a meeting, and there, this is the poster of that meeting. It was organized in, uh, in 2017 uh, with the title Black Holes in the Netherlands, um, uh, Bridging the Gap Between Theoretical Physics and Astrophysical Research uh, on Black Holes. And we had some speakers, you see here at Hoofd, uh, as theorists, Jo van der Brandt, one of the gravitational wave initiators in the Netherlands, Ralph Weyers, an astronomer, and Samaya Nisanke, um, now in Amsterdam, at that time still in Nijmegen. And we decided to have uh, a meeting all together to see what is the common ground, is there some common interest, what are the questions that theorists are asking, what are the questions that astronomers are asking, and can we meet together uh, and just uh, uh, have a nice uh, meeting. And uh, you can see the meeting was on October the 3rd, 2017. And um, although we scheduled this meeting, I don't know exactly, but somewhere in spring perhaps. Uh, and October the 3rd, uh, you probably don't remember, was the day of the Nobel Prize uh, awarded to gravitational waves. So with the whole press uh, uh, live stream and the whole press, uh, press event. And so it was one big party actually that came uh, together just by, uh, by coincidence. Uh, and so it was the start of something nice. Uh, at present we have uh, applied for, uh, 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 or we did apply for a, um, a big grant, um, which is a large consortium, the Dutch Black Hole Consortium. And uh, it basically focuses on four themes that we brought together. Uh, again, the foundation, you can think of the theory, uh, the observation are the astronomers, but of course astronomers, uh, uh, they use instruments, and the gravitational wave people, they use, uh, uh, well, of course, uh, also interferometers, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a whole component on instrumentation, and of course, with all that knowledge that we produce, we want to reach out uh, to the public, uh, develop educational material, what is uh, uh, interesting about black holes for young uh, students and how to make that um, um, visible uh, in, in larger parts of society. And so we are actually planning also to have some uh, exhibitions uh, in the Netherlands. And um, um, so that's a big plan for the next uh, four or five years. Now I'm not here to advertise, make propaganda of the Dutch Black Hole Consortium, but I want to uh, uh, also say that we want to reach out and maybe look for partners, for instance, here in, uh, in Leuven. Of course, many things have happened after uh, also the gravitational waves. We've seen two pictures. One is only uh, a bit more than a week old. The left one is uh, the um, supermassive black hole uh, M87, M87 star. And the right one is in the middle of our own galaxy. I guess you have all seen these pictures. So they are uh, black holes of 6.5 uh, billion solar masses, M87, and a bit over 4 million in Sagittarius A star. And so we see a black hole in the middle. Its shallow shadow is the black spot. It's not exactly the horizon, but it's more like the photon sphere, the, the, the last stable orbit photons can still um, escape from. Uh, and so, but that is getting close to what is called the black hole uh, horizon. It's not exactly, uh, the, the black uh, shadow is not exactly spherically symmetric, um, and that is basically indicating that the black hole is, is rotating, and in fact that you also see a, a, different in, a difference in intensity indicates a Doppler shift, which is associated to the rotation as well. Um, now, that is the astronomy uh, kind of the questions. A theorist sort of uh, ask, or used to ask, or still some theorists um, ask very uh, different questions. We tend to idealize the situation. We don't want anything accretion disk or stuff around the black hole. We want to look at the black hole itself. So what is a, a black hole for a theorist? Well, it is a very, in essence, a simple object. It is something which uh, has an event horizon um, um, within which nothing can escape, from which nothing can escape, not even light. And, um, uh, and in the middle or in the center of this is the black hole singularity. There's all kinds of 
uh, interesting theoretical aspects that we like to understand about the inner parts of the black hole, something that the astronomer uh, doesn't see the point of this. Um, and so we want to understand what is happening in that singularity. Uh, there, quantum effects play an important role and we need quantum gravity probably. Uh, and also we've learned that uh, the event horizon, a black hole is more like a thermodynamical uh, uh, system with an entropy, and that is the famous uh, uh, Bekenstein and Hawking formula. And so we like to understand the microscopic origin of that, uh, of that, um, of the black hole. Now, um, I'm not going to in that route here because if I go into that route, we will not meet astronomy and theory. Um, although maybe uh, one day it could be that uh, we will find maybe the first signatures or deviations of general relativity. Um, and that is of course ultimately the goal to see where the, the, the theory, Einstein's theory of gravity might break down. But in today's lecture, I'm actually going to restrict myself to general relativity. And so, uh, because there's, even there, there are some um, phenomena that we have not yet been observed, which are theoretically interesting and which are also um, uh, interesting from the point of view of astronomy. Of course, most black holes in the universe, uh, they are rotating. Uh, and so that means that the black hole has more structure than just the event horizon, which is located uh, at the, the size of the event horizon is given by this formula. I won't show many formulas here because uh, um, that gets it too, makes it too technical. So A star is the value of the, of the spin in some dimensionless units. Uh, it varies between zero and one. But rotating black holes um, have, um, uh, have another interesting um, property, namely they have an ergosphere. And that means that if you come into the er ergosphere, a particle, you can still escape, but if you're not immediately escaping and you start spinning around, uh, you have to spin in the same direction as the black hole. Even if you decide to beat the system and you come from the other way and try to go uh, spin around the black hole with opposite spin as the, as, the, as the black hole, you will be forced as a consequence of the gravitational force to spin along with the black hole. Now this ergosphere is going to play an important role for my uh, for uh, later uh, slides. So black holes can spin, they have mass. In principle, for a theorist, a black hole can also have charge. Phenomenologically, that is unlikely uh, to um, uh, arise because most of the stellar black holes, uh, they of course arise from collapsing stars. Stars are usually neutral. Uh, and so if there would be a charge, it would quickly neutralize itself uh, and so um, also if, if, if black holes absorb matter from, from other stars, uh, there's an accretion disk, there are charged particles, but typically it will neutralize itself. And from a theorist point of view, if you look at equations, a black hole is, is very simple. It's much easier than stars. You can just write down the solution to Einstein equation very easily, and it contains just three parameters. There is the, the mass, the spin, and the charge. And we theorists say that black hole has no hair. Suppose you throw in a tennis ball of, uh, let's say, um, uh, 100 gram, uh, or an orange of also 100 gram, and none of them are spinning. Uh, it just changes these three numbers, and you can't tell whether the orange went in or the tennis ball went in. And this is the beginning of what is called the information paradox. Uh, that story develops more when you um, uh, use quantum mechanics, but I won't go that route. So. Theoretically, the description of a black hole, if you don't bother uh, with accretion disk or stuff around it, is a very simple object, although its quantum mechanical aspects are hard to understand still. So here's a list of black hole masses and spins. Um, the most, these are stellar black holes. They vary uh, in mass between five solar masses and 15. Um, and the spin values are on the right table. Um, and some of them are almost extremal. So the parameter describing the spin, the parameter A star, uh, its maximal value is, um, is one. Um, if you would go larger than one, then part the, the, the horizon basically would move faster than the speed of light, roughly, and that's not allowed by relativity. And so um, this is, uh, people make catalogs, of course, 
Uh, and there's also stuff that is still uh, ongoing research. I mean, the, these uh, astronomies, uh, of course, uh, are still narrowing down error bars, or sometimes we find kind of mistakes. And you see, for instance, the black hole Cygnus X1, the one but last here in this table that dates from 2006 to 2010. It's still about 14 solar masses. Uh, but last year, this, this question was reanalyzed. Uh, and apparently, there's been a new uh, method to um, estimate the distance uh, towards us. The distance was further away. That means that the object uh, was going to be heavier. And so the current value, uh, as can be looked up in the science paper from last year, is about 21 solar masses. And so that branch of astronomy is, of course, still uh, very uh, important. Cataloging masses, distances. Uh, these are the stellar, uh, 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 stellar black holes. Of course, we also get constraints from spins uh, from gravitational wave physics, uh, but that's also not so easy. And um, uh, so this is a lot of ongoing um, uh, astronomy, uh, and Peter will say more about it. So roughly speaking, that is uh, uh, the theorist point of view. Um, of course, I will talk more about it later. Uh, and so the next thing a theorist would do is let's say, okay, if we restrict to general relativity, we're kind of done with the theory. So let's now add some stuff uh, to the black hole and see what, what, uh, what that does with the black hole, how the stuff arises. And roughly speaking, uh, certainly for the, for the purposes of, the, um, uh, of, the, of, of this talk here, we'll talk about two different things. One is accretion disks uh, around black holes that are obtained usually from infalling matter from, uh, from stars that come close. Uh, and that Peter will present, and then I will get back to the theory about some ongoing uh, research about other particles, um, such as ultralight bosons, dark matter in the presence of uh, uh, black holes, etc. So I'll give the word now to Peter to continue with uh, um, uh, his part of the presentation, Peter. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Uh, let's see if the microphone uh, stays on my head. But uh, so I'll tell you how we, in some instances, do these uh, spin measurements and mass measurements. So one way is where we look at a tidal disruption event. So here's a star that came too close to a black hole. So the tidal forces, yeah, the difference between the gravity of a star uh, on one end and the, the end of the star that was further away from the black hole, the difference in gravity is larger than the self-gravity of the star. The star is ripped apart. Uh, because this star had angular momentum, uh, that angular momentum uh, has to be transported. Uh, angular momentum is not lost, as you know. So this stream of stellar material, some of it will fall into the black hole, and some of it will fall outwards. Uh, and this self-interaction shock, say the stream of the star, the, the, the head bites the tail, and in that shock, um, angular momentum is transported outwards. So this material falls into the black hole and lights it up. And this process is called accretion. It's the most efficient way in the universe to generate energy per best mass uh, unit of a particle. And here, this simulation is for an intermediate mass black hole uh, that is disrupting a particular kind of star, a white dwarf. So these white dwarfs are relatively compact stars. They cannot be disrupted by just any star, uh, any black hole. Uh, I'd like to show another example. Here you have a stellar mass black hole that is uh, tightly disrupting a neutron star. So here there's completely different scales. The stellar mass black hole is uh, of the order of a few solar masses. If it's much more massive, it will not disrupt the neutron star. It will eat it whole. Uh, so some of these black hole neutron star mergers, as we call them, so there are two uh, instances, in two cases this has been observed through gravitational wave radiation, uh, and in principle, depending on the mass uh, of the black hole and the spin of the black hole, you can get an EM light, so an electromagnetic uh, signal out as well. A little bit more to go in depth, a little bit more about these tidal disruption events, so there's two scales that are important, the Schwarzschild radius, equations given to the, to the right there, but also the tidal radius. So the tidal radius, as you can see from the equation, is not a property, not a fixed property of the black hole. It depends on the mass of the black hole, but it also depends on the uh, mass and radius of the star. So that means if you combine those two uh, equations, and if you want that the tidal radius lies outside the Schwarzschild radius, it means that uh, <coughs> 
your mass of the black hole has to adhere to the to this right hand uh, equation so, uh, and these symbols to the bottom are the uh, solar radius and uh, in units of the solar mass so you can see that a star like the sun can only be disrupted by a supermassive black hole that has a mass less than 10 to the 8 solar masses uh, for us to observe a tidal disruption event because otherwise the, the star would be eaten whole by the by the black hole and this equation assumes a non-rotating black hole so if you take a rotating black hole on the other hand uh, the horizon will shrink so if you have a maximally rotating black hole which is on the bottom end of this slide you see the black hole's radius uh, so the ev event horizon radius is half that for a non-rotating black hole what you also see i've uh, drawn this uh, accretion disk it's a very uh, cartoonesque way of drawing an accretion disk, so, but it captures one point. The a typical accretion disk, a standard accretion disk, is uh, geometrically thin, optically thick. And so you see this very narrow uh, strip, but what you also see for a non-rotating -bla black hole, the accretion disk stops at what's called the ISCO. The ISCO stands for innermost stable circular orbit. So there's, the whole, there's a hole in the accretion disk, and that's called the plunging region, so the matter will just plunge into the black hole there. If the black hole is rotating very rapidly, maximally in fact, uh, then the ISCO can extend all the way to the event horizon. And this has two uh, important uh, properties. Namely, the material can keep falling. And so the amount of uh, energy that can be extracted in terms of the rest mass of a particle grows from something like 7% for a non-rotating black hole to about 43%. So 43% of the rest mass uh, energy of a particle can be can be converted to energy and can be rotated away, uh, can be uh, emitted uh, away. Uh, that does not happen in all cases, but in principle you can uh, generate so much energy. So it makes accretion disks around spinning black holes much brighter. Also the temperature goes up, so accretion disk where if you think of this uh, as a multicolor disk black bodies, so black bodies of different uh, temperatures, then the inner part of the disk becomes very, very hot, can start to radiate in the X-rays. Well, in these tidal disruption events, initially there was no material, but all of a sudden there's a lot of material falling into a black hole. There's so much material into the black hole that we express it in this unit of uh, Eddington accretion rate. Uh, most astronomers will know there is a maximum to the uh, amount of mass that you can throw onto or into an object, and this maximum we can express in the Eddington limit. The Eddington limit is assuming an uh, isotropic uh, distribution of material falling in. There's radiation generated in this process, and this radiation is generated in the inner regions, and is mostly directed outwards, so it causes a pressure on the infalling material. If the radiation pressure is so much that it's stronger than the gravitational inward pull, you blow the material away, and that is the Eddington limit. But in this situation, we're not in isotropic, uh, this material coming in mostly in a plane, so you can get above the Eddington limit, and that's what happens in the top part. So then the standard geometrically thin, optically thick accretion disk is uh, puffed up. So the inner part, due to radiation feedback, becomes puffed up geometrically thick as well. So we call this a slim disk. This happens around uh, or when a tidal disruption event occurs. There's so much material falling into the black hole very quickly that the inner part of the such accretion disks uh, puff up. We can model this, and this is a, a somewhat complicated figure. On the y-axis, you see flux, so effectively the amount of light, and this is for a distance of 100 megaparsecs. Uh, and on the x-axis, you see the energy. And you see there's four lines drawn, uh, for two different black hole masses, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 solar masses, and for two different spins, non-spinning, uh, A is 0, and re relatively rapidly spinning. So what you can see, this is the soft X-ray band. If you have data in this band, you can, by looking at the data carefully, determine whether the mass of the black hole is 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6, whether it's spinning, yes or no. So the small differences that you can actually measure. Uh, and I'll show two cases where in this particular case, on the bottom end, you see a small galaxy uh, that sits next to this giant elliptical galaxy that has a redshift of uh, 0.055. And this, uh, this bottom galaxy 
in uh, showed an enormous flare in X-rays that we could follow for five. Uh, we obtained data for five uh, at five epochs spread over a couple of years. Now we see a rather complicated figure again on the y-axis. You see the amount of light, uh, and on the x-axis the energy. And there's five epochs because we observed it in multiple uh, times. Over time, the amount of mass falling into the black hole decreases because the the, st the, the stellar material from the star is just drained. It's it's uh, there's none left at the end. Uh, so that's good. So the mass accretion rate changes as a function of time. Other parameters that we fit, I will not go into detail, but they might change as well. But there's two parameters that will not change. The mass and the spin of the black hole remain constant. So we fit these data in one go with this model, uh, assuming a black hole mass and a black hole spin. We don't know what value, so the three parameters, but they have to be the same across those uh, five epochs. Uh, I won't bother with all the details, but uh, one aspect is we are counting X-ray photons, so we use Poisson statistics, so counting statistics. Uh, and there's some background light that has to do either with the detector or with the astron astronomical background, in, uh, and that we model at the same time as well. Uh, and out of this, you get constraints on the black hole mass and the spin, and these are the, the contours. And you see in this particular case, the red dot is where uh, the best fit uh, value, and the blue uh, and you have to look at the delta, so the only the blue, so uh, 2.3 in delta of the statistics, uh, delta chi squared or delta c stat in this particular case, uh, gives the one sigma uncertainty on these combined parameters. So you see we have a mass of about two, so two times 10 to the 4 solar mass, which is a strange range of uh, black hole masses. We don't know that many black holes. They're called intermediate mass black holes. They're important for, for reasons that I will go won't go into. And you see the spin seems to be quite high. 0.8 is a bit high. There's one big uncertainty in this whole story. Uh, that is that, as I said, this small galaxy next to this giant elliptical galaxy, for the giant elliptical we know the distance, we have the redshift. But for the small galaxy we don't. So if we assume that they're the same, which is a reasonable assumption, but it's still an assumption. If you fit, if you take the distance as an uncertain parameter, in your fit as well, you see that the mass shifts down and the spin constraints become very loose. So the spin is hardly constrained at all. Uh, now we can we have already more data, so we will get the distance to this small galaxy. But at the moment, we know that it's probably intermediate mass black hole here, but we don't know the spin so much. Uh, since spin is a very important parameter for the story that uh, Stephen will finish uh, later on with, I'll show one other case, case number two, where we have another tidal disruption event around, again, a rather light uh, black hole mass. Uh, it's an intermediate mass black hole, as you will see. Uh, here you see the light curve, so the amount of light, the luminosity on the y-axis as a function of time. Again, you see this is years and years, so this is a very long duration event, but still it varies on humanly accessible time scales, which is nice for these very massive black holes. Again, we look at the X-ray spectra. Here I show only three of those spectra. As you saw in the previous slide, we have nine to 10 epochs of data. We, we only, uh, I only show for clarity three. The data again uh, on the y-axis is the amount of light effectively on the x-axis is the energy. You see it varies as a function of time. The, the amount of light drops, uh, the, the spectrum changes a, li a little bit. But if we fit this again with this theoretical model for the slim disk, uh, we can derive the mass and the, and the spin because, again, those two parameters stay the same, whereas other things might vary. And in this particular case, we get a mass of uh, 2 times 10 to the 5 solar masses, again, in the intermediate mass uh, black hole regime. But uh, here we get a very high black hole spin. Yeah, this is, I would say, uh, extremal black hole. Uh, within one sigma, so the red contours, you get to 0.925 is the lowest uh, confidence level that we, uh, within one sigma, still allow. So here we find, again, an intermediate mass black hole very rapidly spinning. So this tidal disruption event seemed to favor finding intermediate mass black holes and rapidly spinning. It doesn't mean that all black holes are intermediate mass and all are spinning rapidly, uh, but we understand why we pick these out. Because, as I explained, if, the, if you have a very rapidly spinning black hole, the inner disk moves in and becomes very bright. A lot of energy is released. So uh, what also happens is the, the peak of the energy shifts from the, 
shifts away from the UV where you expect it, it shifts to the X-rays, and that's where we observe. Uh, so non-spinning black holes of a similar mass would, be, would emit most of their light in the UV, which, as astronomers will know, that's very difficult to observe due to uh, extinction. I'll hand over uh, to uh, Stefan here. Uh, so we have a few massive uh, black holes spinning very rapidly. So Stefan can explain why that's interesting. Okay, thanks. So, so the, 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 we, we have two cases there we, where we want to talk about the stuff around uh, black holes. So one is the um, um, accretion disk, Peter talked about it, and I will talk about now a possible interesting uh, second um, um, phenomena that has to do with super radiance. Now, soon, well, of a couple of years after the um, uh, rotating black hole solution was found by uh, Roy Kerr in the 60s, uh, Roger Penrose uh, discovered something interesting uh, with uh, these rotating black holes. So I got a pointer, so let's see if, uh, if that... Uh, right. So let's see, yes. So here we have a black hole with the horizon here. And the and the yellow uh, yellowish um, uh, is the ergosphere. It's a simplified picture because the ergosphere is not not fully circular. Now we have a particle that comes in and it goes into the ergosphere. Now suppose the particle can uh, can decay. Oops. Uh, let's see what happened here. The particle can decay. We, we, we're also. Uh, what happens uh, to theorists more often? Uh, uh, yeah, I could. This is, this is a phenomenon also called Pauli principle. Yeah. Let, let's see. You're restarting. So wait. Uh, are there any questions so far? <laughs> Maybe. <Yeah. laughs> it's coming. Okay. Yeah, there we are, yes. Okay, very good. So what is this super radiance uh, uh, story? So here we have uh, a particle um, which is moving into the black hole. So suppose it's a quantum mechanical particle that is allowed to decay uh, in two parts. One uh, falls into it and one can escape. There is some certain probability for that. And Penrose discovered that the escaping uh, particle can actually have an energy which is higher than uh, the, the incoming energy. And that is due to the fact that the particle actually can, in fact, extract some of the energy uh, from the black hole and escape uh, with a larger uh, energy than uh, it came in. The black hole then, of course, uh, sudden, uh, or, or slows down a bit, uh, rotates less, 
in, in such a way that there is overall conservation of energy. So Penrose uh, discovered this already, this process he described uh, in 71. And um, there's also more a, um, a quantum mechanical version of this in terms of um, uh, uh, field theory, uh, what theorists are good at, and that is uh, what I will explain a little bit. So now we don't think of particles, we think of waves. <coughs> waves have certain frequencies, and these waves can come from, let's say, uh, uh, the simplest case is a, a scalar field. It's called phi. And um, we expand that in its uh, Fourier components uh, with respect uh, to a frequency here. There's a radial part, and then there's the spherical functions. Um, the details don't matter too much, but we can have particles uh, or waves with frequency modes, and there can be spin parts as well, although the spin doesn't play too much of an important role. Now, it can happen that the, w the amplitude of such wave, uh, just like the energy increase here, it can be that the amplitude, as a consequence of super radiance, gets amplified. Now, how can that be? Because we have a wave here, it's just a plain wave, uh, and there's an, there can be an amplitude if um, the um, uh, frequency actually allows for an imaginary component. So we have to solve a field equation, equation of motion, for these scalar fields in the presence of the, of the um, uh, rotating black hole. And um, if there is an imaginary part which is also positive, and remember there was e to the minus i omega uh, t, um, there's an i here, so minus i plus i, that's one. So if gamma is positive, then this, this plane wave actually receives a, a real part that becomes exponentially increasing. And that triggers what is called an instability, or you can say more down to earth ways, the wave that is actually incoming, it gets amplified. Now, um, a wave gets amplified, but it still goes out. But if the particle has mass, it can be attracted back to the black hole, and the process can repeat itself. And so you can have waves that come in, get amplified, they get uh, attracted again uh, because they have mass. Uh, the details follow from calculations, of course, and this process happens. So that can mean that, in fact, the, um, um, the, um, that particles tend to, or scalar field particles, can condense close to the black hole and form a kind of cloud. I'll make a picture uh, um, uh, that illustrates this. So uh, you can compute when this the superradiant effect is the, um, is, the, is, the, is the strongest, and that happens when the Compton wavelength of such a particle um, is of the same size as the black hole itself. So the wave should have wavelengths which are comparable to this gigantic object. Well, that means that the particle should be very, very light. In terms of equations, um, um, it is actually, um, well, given by here, the mass of the particle, that is called mu, should be larger than the rotational velocity of the black hole. And this m is not the, ma <laughs> it's not the mass, but it's the spin quantum number. Um, uh, for, all present, for all purposes of this talk, just set it equal to one. And so in the appropriate units, the mass should be smaller than the rotation. So you see also that heavy particles, like in the accretion disk, they can't cause super radiance instability because they are too heavy. They will, they will be damping because gamma will be negative. But for very light particles, uh, smaller than the velocity, uh, then this instability can uh, continue. And it continues, actually, until this inequality is, uh, uh, is no longer satisfied. So just like in the Penrose process, you extract some of the rotational velocity of the black hole. The black hole starts to slow down, also omega. And at some point, omega becomes too small and the process stops because um, mu becomes equal to omega. And so uh, you can, in fact, um, um, plot the ranges of, of the masses for kind of um, uh, typical uh, black holes, ranging from stellar masses, stellar black holes, to supermassive black holes. And the heavier the black hole is, um, the, the uh, lighter the ultralight boson should be. And the ranges typically that you have is that it should vary between uh, energies uh, of 10 to the minus 21 electron volt to 10 to the minus 12 electron volt. These are very, very small numbers. Um, and um, um, 
But uh, the question then is whether these particles exist. Now, of course, you go to particle physicists and you talk to them what are light particles. Now, in the standard model, there's nothing there. But we know there should be also physics, uh, well, most likely, uh, physics beyond the standard model. Uh, things like QCD axions uh, can have uh, particles uh, or can be scalar particles that are sort of close to this uh, uh, upper bound or heavier, so then they would be out. Uh, but also dark matter can be a candidate for these ultralight particles. If you're a string theorist uh, and you do um, um, string compactifications from 10 to 4 dimensions, you get a lot of very light scalar fields that can have masses. Very often they're massless, but if you switch on some stuff, then you can make them uh, have masses in these, in these windows. So it's an opportunity. Uh, nobody knows whether these uh, 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 particles really exist, but it's an opportunity to use astronomy of black holes to um, interplay with particle physics and uh, physics beyond uh, the standard model. And that is exciting. So roughly speaking, the picture is as follows. So this is uh, not just my work. I'll talk about one of my papers soon. Um, a picture developed that was called, given a name uh, more recently, the gravitom. It's something like a uh, hydrogen atom. The black hole is the nucleus. And then we have this cloud of scalar particles. And um, uh, they can be in these clouds. Uh, they have certain uh, um, uh, angular distribution, just like the electron clouds um, uh, around a hydrogen atom. And uh, these are the red blobs. Then there might be an accretion disk as well. And so this is, roughly speaking, the picture uh, of uh, such a um, um, ultralight boson cloud uh, around a, um, a black hole. Now, so it's a, comp a complicated interplay between accretion disk and a black hole and then these clouds. These clouds can actually become very, very massive. They can have masses. Of course, there's parameters in the game and you can tune stuff, but they can have masses which are comparable to the mass of the black hole itself. And so it's worth interest, uh, it's interesting and I think worth studying what can be the interplay between uh, the accretion disk uh, and the clouds and the black hole, or what can be the interactions between such clouds and the accretion disk that P Peter was also uh, talking about. And I think nobody has really uh, uh, studied this um, uh, in detail. So these clouds don't live forever. Um, they can also decay and emit gravitational waves. And so that is also interesting for the gravitational wave community. And there are papers about this, how much emission of gravitational waves uh, uh, such a cloud um, um, uh, can give and whether that can lead to an observable signature. And those are interesting calculations. I think the, the, the numbers that come out are not yet realistic, uh, but I will present some of my own numbers and they will also not be realistic. But It can, yes, yeah. It depends what is the final value of the spin. So it, there's a competition of lots of effects. So the, the, the cloud is growing and the spin goes down. Uh, and when the spin is large and, and, and the, the, the clouds decay, there might be some remaining particles. And so by that time, the spin is too small already to have a reasonable, uh, um, to, to start this process again. But again, sometimes you can tweak numbers that this might precisely happen. Uh, so, um, so, so if this black hole uh, superradiance is borrowing some of the spin, the angular momentum of the black hole, and so I explained to you that um, the, um, uh, the size of the horizon uh, depends on the value of the spin from, uh, from uh, two times the Schwarzschild, uh, from the Schwarzschild radius if it's not spinning to half of the Schwarzschild radius uh, if it's maximally spinning and, and anything in between. So if the black hole spins down, then also the size of the black hole, the horizon itself, uh, changes. And if the horizon itself changes, then also the shadow of the black hole should change. So we thought that uh, uh, when we started this project, this was with uh, uh, Gaston, K uh, oh, the name is spelled wrongly here, Kretschy, uh, and Helfi Wittek. Uh, we investigated uh, um, this project uh, or the question how the shadow uh, of a black hole will change uh, as a function of time um, when superradiance takes place. And I'll present you some of the results. It's a, well, it's, a, it's a theoretical calculation. And here are basically the plots. Well, there's basically three phases. 
One is where super radiance does not yet play a role, phase zero, then it kicks in, uh, and then basically the process stops. Um, and so you can see here, we, we, we plotted this for M87, just to take an example, but we don't know the spin of M87, so we gave M87 a, a, a spin of 0 0.8, chi is really A star, and we computed uh, uh, using super radiance, what is the time evolution of um, um, uh, the change of the spin in this case. And here, it's, it's, it's how the mass changes. So, and then these plots comes out. Um, so the spin stays for a long time, more or less constant, and then it sort of fastly changes in period one. But look at the time scales that came out of our analysis. It is, it is really of order of 10 to the eight um, um, to 10 to the 12 that this period, so that's essentially 10 to the 12 years before you see uh, the spin going down from uh, 0 0.8 to something uh, uh, 0 0.0. But you could also say, oh, super radiance is going on for a very long time. Uh, that is true, uh, but uh, the question is what we will later uh, 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 observe. I'll, I'll show you next plot. Here's the plot of the mass that goes down. The time scales are similar. It's a very long process, and you see over these years, the mass actually is roughly speaking constant because it just decreases from, from one, this is over solar mass. Um, um, uh, well, this is the initial mass which we took M87 and so on. Of course, there are some initial conditions that actually are important here. It depends on what is your starting cloud. You can have a large cloud to start with or a small cloud and then you get different uh, kind of plots, something like uh, uh, the red one or the dotted one. This is a, uh, a, a small cloud, this is a what larger cloud, etc. cetera. Um, and so uh, then we went on to compute how the, uh, once you know how the spin changes and how the mass changes, you can actually compute how the shadow of the black hole changes. There is technology, it goes also back to papers of Bardeen. This is the kind of calculations that the astronomers are also using, computing the shadow given the mass and the spin, uh, etc. And so the times of, and now everything becomes time dependent here. Uh, and so this is the effect, solely the effect of super radiance. So we didn't, no accretion disk, no gravitational waves emitted. That is a, 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 an effect that takes uh, place uh, at even larger time scales, we think. And so this is purely super radiance effects. And um, well, here we see, so these are numbers uh, uh, for the black hole diameter or the shadow in micro arc seconds. I think this we did now for um, 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 Sagittarius A star, but all the plots are, are, are actually very similar. And you see that the shadow actually increases um, from 36.5 to well, something like 38. There's even a little bit uh, um, of a bubble. Uh, that is because sometimes the mass uh, exchange or mass drop can for a moment go faster than the, than the spin and then um, uh, it, it can have uh, these, 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 these effects. But it doesn't, the details don't matter of this. So here uh, we, can plot vari we can have various plots depending on what is the initial spin. So chi is again a star, the, the, the spin. Uh, and so if you start with a, a, a very, very high spin of almost extremality, but these are maybe phenomenologically relevant, then you can see um, uh, an increase in the shadow diameter. Um, and um, if the spin is small, then the effect is almost negligible. So for very high spins, you can have some interesting um, um, change in the shadow diameter. But again, you see the time scales, even if you restrict yourself in this phase, phase one here, is between 10 to the eight and 10 to the 11 years. Uh, and uh, I thought like, oh, that's only three powers of 10, so that's a thousand years, but that is of course wrong. It's 10 to the 11 minus 10 to the eight, which is still 10 to the 11th, uh, roughly. And um, so, um, so yeah, here are some numbers again, so, so which are more, which would be more uh, realistic. So suppose you would be in this phase um, where you tune your parameters such that it's maximally interesting um, then you can plot, uh, and you watch this uh, object for about 30 years. Uh, so we're watching observation time of 30 years when, the, when the, um, the change of rate is maximal. 
then you can see the, um, uh, depending on whether you start with a large cloud uh, seed, we call it, or a small one, you see in micro arc seconds, um, if we watch 30 years and we plot it for stellar black holes, these are the, the sort of somewhat massive, more messy, sorry, massive black holes from gravitational waves. These are the supermassive ones. You see that the change in the shadow, if you watch the thing 30 years, it's still 10 to the minus five, or for the supermassive, 10 to the minus nine. Uh, there's no way you're going to see this uh, with current um, um, telescopes or uh, instruments, uh, and not, not, not even, I think, in the immediate uh, uh, future. So, so this is an attempt of a theorist uh, trying to do something with, uh, with observation. Um, I think it is still very interesting, uh, uh, not because these numbers, uh, but the, the phenomena of super radiance uh, that can exist uh, uh, and do something, uh, can have other observable signatures that well, maybe this is not the right observable. There could be other observables that might, might be more sensitive and more close to observation. And so um, um, I think this was still an, an interesting uh, exercise of a theorist uh, to um, uh, see how these effects like super radiance uh, can, uh, can be observed. So um, here's another uh, slide from one of the papers by Peter. We also discussed this. Uh, and uh, we see this is, again, you see the kind of time scales that are involved and the kind of masses of the particles. And in this investigation, there's constraints on the masses uh, that, that are within the, in the, uh, in the, in the yellow bands. Um, and so you get similar numbers for the masses and for the time scales. And um, um, so this is not just uh, some exercise, Peter and me, and so on. There's a large kind of community that actually works on, on the effect of super radiance and, um, um, and how it can connect uh, to new phenomena such as uh, uh, axion clouds. You can do the same uh, for other spin particles, like uh, a massive photon, a PROCA field. It's, an, it's a spin one particle with a mass. Um, and then you get similar properties. And uh, you can also try to do something with fermions, but that is a, a little bit different because of the statistics and so on. So this is an interesting thing. I think uh, uh, maybe, maybe our results are not immediately relevant for observation, but I think it is an interesting uh, study to see whether um, uh, the whole enterprise of determining the spin, the question of how fast black holes can actually spin, the interaction uh, of black hole with accretion uh, is an important uh, uh, object, but also matter, maybe the fundamental question of are there any other particles that can, that can swirl around somewhere uh, around the black hole and are there ways to detect it? And maybe not by the time evolution of the shadow, but maybe there are some other um, um, phenomena or observables. So we're almost, uh, we're almost done. This is the uh, concluding uh, uh, slide. So I think the, uh, the interplay between uh, kind of theory and uh, ast uh, astronomy, I think it is very interesting. Uh, we learn from each other. We sometimes ask very different questions. I want to know what is inside the black hole. An astronomer couldn't care less. Uh, but there is definitely uh, a common ground. And I gave one example of where um, 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 uh, um, there are interests both from uh, uh, astrophysics, particle physics even, and uh, the general relativity community. And so we want to do tests of general relativity, of course, uh, and so we're doing that both with gravitational waves and with the Event Horizon Telescope, for instance. And um, so we're, we're improving our tests on general relativity, and this is not boring at all. Um, there is also um, many, uh, there's of course a lot of predictions already from general relativity, but there are still some unobserved phenomena, such as the phenomena of super radiance, that one would like to in fact um, um, uh, uh, discover. And it's really inherited uh, or it's really connected to uh, the fact that black holes are rotating. And the fact that, that there is an ergosphere. So the physics of the ergosphere from an astronomical Astrophysical point of view, I think this is a somewhat larger question. Uh, I think um, um, should be studied further, and I think will also be studied further. Peter, of course, um, explained uh, very nicely the physics of the tidal 
uh, disruption e uh, events and uh, the accretion disk uh, models. Um, also there, of course, is a lot of theoretical work uh, doing plasma physics, um, uh, magnetohydrodynamics, and so on. Um, there's also an unexplored uh, territory um, about uh, intermediate black holes. Huh? We either have stellar black holes or supermassive, and there's a whole gap in between. And, uh, well, I think the first intermediate black hole was only really found out of the collision uh, of two smaller ones in a gravitational wave uh, effect. And so that will be a whole uh, new field of study that can be both interesting theoretically and, uh, and astrophysically, and so on. Uh, and, of course, we want to understand better the physics of these near extremal spinning uh, black holes. Those are very important also from a theoretical point of view. The extremal black holes or near extremal black holes, theorists, uh, uh, including people here in the audience, they play a, uh, uh, quite a lot uh, uh, with near extremal black holes because they have interesting structures, sometimes even holographic descriptions, uh, and uh, maybe um, at some point also quantum gravity uh, can come into the game. And um, uh, yeah, with these words, uh, I think we can uh, um, stop the, the, the presentation and uh, thank you for, uh, for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. So I will ask the speakers to share the, mi the other microphone, and I will use this microphone to uh, people have questions. Thank you. H how is the theoretically maximum value of the spin of the black hole determined? Well, it was. Um, how is it determined? Well, basically, mathematically. Um, it was, uh, um, so R Schwarzschild wrote down his solution in, in what was it, uh, 1916. Is it, is it switched on? Yes, 1916. And then in the 20s, I think people first, the theorists, they first wrote down uh, the charged black holes, no spinning yet. And then they found already uh, an interesting thing that, that the, the charge of a black hole also has an upper value, a maximal value. And this you can also understand uh, physically if you try to charge more, at some point the Coulomb repulsion wins over the gravitational attraction. And then later, uh, Kerr, uh, uh, in the 60s, he just solved Einstein's equation to describe uh, spin black holes, and he just found that there is a, a maximal value. And roughly speaking, you can think of it uh, as follows. So suppose you have the horizon, and you put a dot somewhere, and you follow how that rotates. And then if the, the parameter A star, um, um, uh, goes over one, then um, it, 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 its angular velocity would be larger than the speed of light. This is a little bit of an intuitive picture. You will have to go a little bit more into the details. Uh, but Kerr found also that if A star is larger than one, the black hole has no horizon at all, and the singularity becomes naked. Uh, naked in the sense that uh, not shielded by a horizon, so you would be able to see it, this curvature signal. Now that could actually be sort of interesting because you could see a place where the curvature is really high. But then further studies showed that uh, these singul naked singularities cannot occur. And there's always some physical mechanism that prevents naked singularities. And in this case, it would be the principle of relativity, um, saying that the horizon cannot m rotate faster than the speed of light. So roughly speaking, that is the explanation. Yeah, so maybe this is a bit of a, uh, an astrophysical follow-up on this question. So the plot, if I saw this correctly, for case two, this tidal disruption event was cut off at 0.998, but with a lot of support close to this. So could you comment on this? Yeah, I think uh, the answer maybe is again for Stefan, but the uh, reason is that uh, I think it's the, the foreign limit shows that you don't, uh, astrophysically, you don't spin up black holes to beyond that value. So this was uh, imposed as a theoretical constraint. Yeah. Uh, but I think um, this depends on the details of the accretion, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, so I don't know whether it's possible to form out of something something that rotates at A is one, but you can't spin it up to that value. There's this limiting value. Right, but for instance, in your case, uh, it's not true that I could, for instance, experimentally check whether I can get to 0 0.999 or whether there's significant evidence for this as opposed to this 0 0.998 where it was cut off. I think that the uncertainties in our measurements, the systematical effects involved, will not also not allow this test, but uh, yeah, as a thought experiment, you can obviously do this. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Question for Stefan. Can you, could you go back to your, b some of us love waves. So could you go back to your wave equation, please? Uh, the beautiful spherical harmonics, one, one more. Yes, thank you. So, um, I'm just a poor astrophysicist in Newtonian physics, right? But when we do wave equations of rapidly spinning objects, called stars, then we do not at all work with spherical harmonics anymore because you have more complex mathematical functions to do that more properly. And these shift the frequencies tremendously, orders of magnitude sometimes. So I wonder why, I, I mean, are you doing this with spherical harmonics for simplicity? You, you, you're the theorist, you can do that better. And so what would that impact in your electron volt range, because I can imagine this can shift quite a bit. Um, well, um, I might have to think a little bit more about it, but uh, one of the things in, in general relativity is that y you can use coordinates whatever you want, but it's very important to specify which coordinates. And in the intermediate calculations, the calculations might differ a lot, but the final the final answer for any observable uh, uh, cannot depends on the coordinates. So, this formula is written down in very specific coordinates. It's uh, they are called the Boyer Lindquist uh, coordinates, and in the, in in these coordinates, people make these uh, 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 calculations. And so, um, I I know there is some literature where you don't use these coordinates and you don't use the spherical harmonics. Um, but I, I don't have it clear in my mind to give you probably the answer of how the calculation then goes. But the, the, the final result about the super radiant effect uh, and, its, and its amplitude, uh, that should not depend, of course, on which coordinates you choose. Well, if it does, you, you, you made an error some, or I made an error then. So. No, but we are observers. We are observers, so we observe in an inertial frame in the end. So you have to do all these transformations, and then you have a Doppler effect. So I, I maybe we're talking different languages here, but I got struck by the simplicity of your expressions. Yes. Well, of course, I didn't show the entire calculation. Um, um, but um, maybe it's something I should look at first before trying to give an answer. And uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is anyone else struck by the simplicity of all the equations? <laughs> the, the black hole case is indeed a lot simpler than stars, and the equation is yeah. separable, but in general you get a type of spheroidal harmonics rather than just the spherical ones, but you can do this exactly, but it's not quite the spherical ones here, correct? People do that, in fact, as well. Well, I mean, in some approximations. Yeah. Yeah. Any other question? Going back to the uh, X-ray data from a few TDS uh, events, so those data are coming from a galaxy far, far away, right? Or can you be certain that this is from a TD that you're actually witnessing a TD? Uh, I think it's by the process of elimination okay. that we know uh, most that this is a TDE. Also, the amounts of the so the luminosities involved tell us that it's. Uh, it's not something else. So accretion is the, the, the only phenomena that we know that uh, generates these kind of um, li yeah, amount of uh, luminosity mm. in a short time scale. They're nuclear. So far, we constrain all these uh, ourselves for tidal disruption events to be nuclear in the host galaxy. It doesn't have to be. Hey, you have kicked black holes, so but that's all complications that we, uh, for now, don't look at. Right. Yeah. And the observation of those TDs, how do you detect them? Is it uh, by... Uh, 
random chance that you observe a galaxy and then uh, you do surveys and then you compare from one epoch to another, or do you have other strategies? Yeah, it's a, um, well, the rates are that in if you look at 10,000 galaxies uh, over a year, you'll, you'll find one TDE. Okay. So n these days, most time observation events are found from optical surveys because they observe the whole uh, hemisphere, say, uh, uh, every uh, other night or so. That's the highest cadence that I know of at the moment. So several tens of tidal disruption event candidates have been found. The very blue, so they're distinct from other uh, type of uh, transients that we know. So they're, they're much more blue than supernovae, for instance. Right. They're in the nucleus. You take a spectrum, they have s particular spectral uh, uh, characteristics. So many, or most, these days are found in the optical. Uh, but some are found serendipitously, so by chance, in x-rays. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, some of the satellites, they, they, keep, uh, they keep observing while they go from one target to the next, so they slew, mm -hmm. and during this slew, they keep taking data and they cross over ra uh, random patches of the sky, but you know what used to be there from all sky surveys before. So you see, hey, something flared up by a factor of 100 or so, then you can better have another look. Yeah. All right, thank you. So I, I was wondering about these boson uh, clouds. So they're essentially too static or they're quasi-static, so you cannot probably not measure their evolution. <coughs> but how much energy um, is roughly in those clouds? Because if the, you know it's comparable to something you could measure just gravitationally, right? I mean, then it's okay that it's static essentially. Yes, absolutely. That's a good question. Uh, uh, in fact, we were discussing this also in the car on the way here. Um, so. Of course, you can play with numbers, but you, you can sort of like best case scenarios is that the mass of the cloud, uh, I, I, we have some plots somewhere in the paper, becomes of the same order as the mass of the black hole. Um, and that is very interesting because now, if there would be nothing else around, okay, well then that's the cloud and uh, maybe, well, if you can't see the cloud, game over. But if you now put an accretion disk uh, on it, you can start to think about the effect, what, what, what gravitational effect uh, can the cloud have on the accretion disk. Uh, we were thinking of some examples where we, we know that sometimes these, these accretion disks, they can wobble a bit uh, because it's not fully aligned with the black hole. Peter can explain that better. And maybe, maybe the cloud uh, can have some effect on this as well. And this wobbling that has been seen by you, uh, among, uh, others. Uh, among others, uh, here. Maybe you can say something about this. Yeah, that, um, let's see. I cut it out of the presentation because we had too much already. So it's, uh, let's see if we continue a little bit. If there is time. So here there's a tidal disruption event and around a spinning black hole. And what you see is that the stream of material, so the left panel for you is X, Y, and the right panel is Y, Z. So you see three planes. What you see is that nodal precession tilts these uh, streams out of their initial orbit, uh, and then the streams will not self-interact, and after a while they will self-interact. And uh, the accretion flow is dragged into the plane, in the equatorial plane of the spinning black hole. And especially if you have a very high accretion rate, so this slim disk, then the inner part of the disk will, ro will wobble as a solid body. And this effect, in a completely different system, namely a stellar mass black hole is uh, accreting steadily from a, st a star, but due to uh, physics in the disk, there was an enormous surge of mass through the disk, and then the mass flow was again super Eddington, and then you get this solid uh, rocking of this uh, inner part of the disk. To that is tied the jet, this outflowing uh, amount of particles and uh, energy that is then seen uh, to, to wobble as well. And that was seen in this particular stellar mass black hole accreting at a very rapid pace uh, briefly. Uh, but if you have such a process around a black hole where there's also this boson cloud, very massive of similar mass to the black hole, then this boson cloud, which is also in the equat equatorial plane of the black hole spin, I was told by uh, Stefan this morning, that will have an influence, at least on the, on the frequency of this solid, uh, yeah, rigid body accretion disk uh, wobbling. But I don't think anyone has taken that into account or calculated what would be the magnitude of that effect. 
But this is something that we discussed like, oh, hang on, that might be something that we can uh, actually do. Sorry, I was working for Connie at the same <laughs> time. Uh, I have two questions, but one I'll save for the drinks. Uh, the first one is uh, these clouds decay, you said. Uh, in what? Can we observe that? They could decay and, and uh, emit gravitational waves. Uh, they don't decay into electromagnetic radiation or anything. That would be nicer. Well, th that depends. Uh, no, that could also happen. Uh, it depends on your model for the uh, for the bosonic field. If you if 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 you let these, so you have to you have to start with a theoretical model. You have scalar fields, uh, bosons, uh, uh, and you can let them interact with with radiation or not. And you can choose what is the coupling. It's a parameter. We we switched it off uh, uh, because it's easier to make that calculations. But if you switch it on, uh, then uh, in fact uh, um, uh, there can be other interplay between. Uh, uh, there can be electromagnetic radiation. There can be even an interaction, also an electromagnetic interaction between the cloud and the and the radiation from the accretion disk. People have done that kind of exercise and put other bounds already from M87. Uh, and uh, uh, and um, depending on the coupling between the axion and the and the photon, uh, you can get some r uh, stricter bounds on these mass ranges or not. So um, all these exercises are not yet um, uh, fully explored. Can you visualize the lab? Well, that's precisely how they did it uh, from the polarization. So the first uh, in the first picture, M87 polarization was not included. Uh, later on, uh, it was, and from the polarization studies, uh, they uh, they got the bounds on the mass of this uh, axion that would couple uh, uh, to the photon. Yes, indeed. So that's that was a paper from this year, a few months ago. Maybe one last question. If not, thank you, uh, Joris. So um, I'm working for Cleo now because she asked me to encourage everybody in this room uh, to join us for drinks and uh, lively discussions in the cafeteria of the 200D building. And as you have noticed, uh, I very purposefully will give the floor there to our youngsters because I think they interact way better than us oldies. And uh, the idea is to uh, discuss that in whatever kind of uh, topic uh, you would like. So please uh, join us. But before we do that, let's thank our speakers again.